Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another exciting edition of Third Virtual Free Thursday with the Foss Waterway Seaport. I'm your guide this evening, Chris, and tonight's entire presentation is generously brought to you by Columbia Bank and Tacoma Creates, allowing you guys to experience yet more of the fantastic history of this area and hopefully uncover some things that you didn't know before. Tonight, I have a question for you. Uh, I'm curious if you know that story about a 571 foot monster, devastating ecological conditions, pollution and destruction of an area in pursuit of riches with shady political back dealings. And of course, uh, Frank Herbert, if you're familiar with that story, yes, of course, it's the story of Tacoma. Whew, a lot's going on tonight. We're going to talk about the Asarco um, plant, the smelting operation that existed out on the northern end of Tacoma, the southern end of Ruston, and for about 100 years, really, uh, wreaked absolute devastation on this area here. And kind of how we got there and where we are now, which I think is the hopeful glimmer for this future. So for those of you who know this story, for those of you who are learning it for the first time, welcome, welcome all. Let's let's start with a little bit of backstory here, just in case for whatever reason you're you're not familiar with this. First of all, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you guys, and I'm glad that you're on board because this is um this is a big one. So a Sarco, a Sarco, American Smelting and Refining Co. It was the Tacoma smelting operation. It operated approximately from 1890 until 1986, though it underwent some different name changes over that time. But it all takes place right on the fringe of this beauty right here. This is Point Defiance Park in its early days. Point Defiance, um, if you're not familiar, was originally supposed to be a military installation. Uh, the Wilkes expedition came through and was like, wow, this spot got good cliffs. It's right in between these two different waterways. You could hold off and be defiant against the world. And so they're like, boom, we want it. Of course, it never was turned into a military installation. And so it was this virgin, untouched old growth forest where so much of Tacoma had been clear cut and then milled down on the waterfront there. And eventually this gets turned over to what it is now, which is a 700 plus acre city park for Metro Parks here in the Tacoma Ruston area. And right on the edge of it, literally just right on the border was one of the greatest uh, industries. Really, it's, it's hard to talk about Asarco and get the whole picture, which I'm gonna attempt to do tonight, but it was a massive, massive industry. And when it started off, here's a glorious shot we have in 1888, back when it was the Tacoma Smelter. And this smelter was down on Ruston's waterfront where they would take carts of ore and then they would refine it down as best they could into pure metal, which then would be processed or sold around the world. And this was established in 1887 by uh, Ryan Smelter or as the Ryan Smelter by a guy named Dennis Ryan. And then it was eventually sold to William Rust, who I think was the most famous local owner of this whole operation over time. And a lot of you are probably familiar with William Rust because of this gem right now. This is the original Rust Mansion, the White House of the West, as it's called. That's right down now on I Street. And if you've been following along lately, it's currently being refurbished. All that beautiful Wilkerson sandstone is getting polished once again, and the interior is being brought back to its historic integrity. And they're doing a really good job with with the production and cleaning up of that. But William Rust was the guy who buys the, the Ryan smelter. He turns, I think, the most amount of development into infrastructure for the town of Ruston, which, as you may have guessed, is named in honor of Mr. William Rust. I think the township for the workers was originally just called Smelter. And they were like, oh, that's not great. Thank you, Mr. William Rust, for all your hard work. Why don't we name the town after you, Rustin? Which 
gives us Rust Town, Rustin as we have it today. And Rustin has been primarily since the 1880s through the 1980s a town compromised of of comprised, sorry, not compromised, comprised of workers for the the smelting. It's lived and breathed in more ways than one on the lifeblood of the smelting operation out there. And this is them in production, right? So they take ore and originally they were processing lead. And then eventually after they hit copper production, copper became the main product of the Asarco plant, which William Rust ends up selling in 1905. It changes hands now and then goes on to become the Asarco that we have until the 1980s. And here they are, they, they take the, the ore, they process the copper from it, and then there's a significant amount of byproducts that come out of that. This is from, I think this is from 1910, as the Asarco smelting operation is starting to really grow in its capacity out there. And it's important to understand how much it has terraformed the area. Not only did they clear a huge swath to create the actual smelting facility, as is pictured here, but the, the course of the railroad is dependent on that position. If you've ever seen a map of the Tacoma Railroad, right? It seems strange that it would come all the way up the coast to where Point Defiance is, and then they tunnel underground from right where the Asarco plant was, underground all the way across to essentially the south section of where Salmon Beach is, and to build a tunnel over a mile through this area wasn't the easiest way to get a train around the area, especially when you consider how much farther south the tide flats are. But the money and the industry was at Asarco. And so the train and now the tunnel, this is the same tunnel that we have up there today. This was the, um, I think it was Nelson Bennett. He's the same guy who did the tunnel that finally got the train through Snoqualmie Pass, essentially. Massive feat of engineering. And when he got here, he developed this tunnel as well to help the train get from Asarco over and then down the coast as it eventually continues on its way down towards Portland. <clears throat> Here's an aerial view of Asarco with its most famous feature, the 571 foot stack, whose job, its job was to take the smoke from the smelting of this ore and distribute it gracefully into the stratosphere, sending it so far away that its pollution wouldn't be an issue for the people. And look at this place. It was a massive industry. This is uh, a spark at a glance. This is from an article in the 90s which looked at um, Asarco's production and how it had declined from the late 80s into the early 90s, but a tremendous amount of copper production was done right here in the Tacoma area. I've seen estimates that say 13% of the world's copper production was coming from right here in Tacoma. And with it, byproducts that come from that. Uh, sulfur dioxide and lead were both major products distributed out from the Asarco plant. And it was a one-stop shop. You could get the train directly up to the smelting facility from the waterfront there. And then ships could actually come and dock right on the other side of this major facility right down there on the waterfront. And it wasn't just the engineering of the space that they contributed to. They were also responsible for actually creating a lot of the, the landmass itself that they have out there. So if we just flip through sort of a, a photo book, a photo flip book of a hundred years here, this one is from 1889 when you're looking at when it was originally from the Ryan smelter, then to William Rust's facility, then eventually a Sarko. And here it is. Uh, the stack was completed in 1917. So seven years after this picture was taken. And the stack really is a marvel we can get into a whole bunch of stuff about the stack and what it means but at 571 feet it was the tallest stack in the world it was 
I mean, it was iconic. It was like the Tacoma Dome originally. It was such a prevalent and distinct feature for Tacoma, and it was a huge source of pride. It was a blazing torch summoning business and industry and money to the area. There were jobs aplenty. There was copper production all over. People were making money hand over fist, and it was because of this stack. 2.5 million bricks soaring up into the sky for the safety of all, distributing those fine materials way, way up so that they have plenty of time to disperse and not affect the people. That's how the story goes. So the stack is here from 1917 into 1925. Here it is in 1940s. Uh, at one point, it was hit by an earthquake and reduced slightly in height when they had to go back and prove the structural integrity of it. Here it is in the 1970s. And the, the official statement from ASARCO was that in order to render the waste gases as harmless as possible, they are discharged into the atmosphere so that they may be highly diluted before they can diffuse back to Earth. The question of damage caused by the smelter smoke is still highly controversial and it's very difficult to make positive statements about it. Whoo! So here's where things get tricky, my friends. It's not. If you take away anything from tonight, it's not difficult. I do, there's a lot of things that we can say one way or the other. Um, I tried to be as balanced as possible on this whole thing, but I need you to understand that this 571 foot stack while in the process of refining copper was discharging arsenic, lead, and sulfuric dioxide up, up into the air and then eventually into the soil around this area here. How much of this area here? About a thousand square miles. And that's just the tip of the iceberg as to what's going on out here in Asarco. In some cases, uh, a literal tip. So as they're, as they're cruising out here, they're a hero, especially when World War II happens, right? After the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, there is now a massive uphaul, almost overnight, of trying to turn the United States into a war-ready nation and making sure that they can produce as much materials, combat vehicles, bullets, ammunition as they can possibly do. And Asarco is a huge part of that. And they are producing a lot of the munition and the copper and the lead that is used in the effort. And I'm trying to remember the exact year on this photograph. I believe it was 1949. And you can see just what a boom industry it was out here. And what I love are the, the safety first signs that you see everywhere. Uh, in fact, Asarco, here's again from 1949, where they, they had their open house for everyone in the area here, demonstrating the amount that they were doing to ensure the safety of their workers and the public in the area here. And in 1949, Asarco was one of the largest industries in Tacoma. And at that time, they had 1,304 employees and a payroll of over 345,000 annually. $345,000 annually as the payroll in 1949. And to achieve that, uh, in, I believe, 1948, the company smelted almost 400,000 tons of ore and 100,000 tons of copper were refined. And that's a striking figure that I want you to keep in mind. Very small portion of copper ore can actually be refined down into usable copper, right? You know, uh, if you're going on that figure right there, one fourth of it, uh, actually a little bit less on that. So you end up with a tremendous amount of byproduct in your copper production. But that wasn't on the radar really for people at the time because what we were talking about were institutions like this. This is Beatrice Carmichael behind the counter in the Rustin Liquor Store operated by herself and her husband, Dean. Uh, this was in January of 1979. And this was after 20 years where Rustin finally regained its own liquor store. This 700 square foot facility uh, was not a state run liquor agency before that. It was uh, an, a company. It was a company institution. Asarco had 
everything. They had their own grocers. They had their own liquor store. They were responsible for a huge amount of the success of Ruston as a town, not just because they created the town itself and provided jobs to the vast majority of that population. But if you look here, as late as 1985, Asarco's taxes paid by that plant made up for more than half of Ruston's budget. So we're talking uh, garbage pickup, uh, just town infrastructure, making sure that it was a town and that the people were there, that the police force was paid for, that everything was taken care of. And Asarco did that. So there was a tremendous amount of affection for this plant by the people that lived there. It was literally the lifeblood, so much so that this stack is often featured in family pictures, <laughs> uh, like this one from the late 1960s. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the early 1960s here. This is a, a family portrait here uh, of the Grover and Wakefield family out there, and very proud to be a part of the community. So there's the stack, the, the elusive missing family member invited to every major family gathering. So here's where things get tricky. As, as really early as the 1940s, people were aware of the fact that there were detrimental side effects to the materials that were being released into the area there. And a lot of it came to light with just the people that actually worked in the smelting facility. The guys whose job it was to actually go in and handle the arsenic, which was produced as a byproduct of copper production, um, there are there are like ghost stories and legends of the zombies of Rustin Way because uh, the effects of that much direct arsenic are twofold. One, it will stain you blue permanently. Uh, the other is that it reduces mental capacity. It effectively kills your brain. And so there were like stories from school children that in the misty mornings walking to school, they'd see the long line of mumbling, shambling blue men walking along the waterfront. And this was a Sarco, a Sarco employees. These were people responsible for handling the arsenic um, who had their lives massively truncated. But at the time, you know, the world was incredibly dangerous and especially high industry like this, but it was providing direct results, economic, financial, provable results. And it was creating these better lives for people. So a lot of people not only didn't question it, but were incredibly fond of the Asarco facility and saw it as really the gem of Tacoma, the, the great shining torch that was providing life to this area. And that thinking would continue for some time, even though a great deal was going on just beyond sight, although not really, often in plain sight with Asarco. As environmental concerns got stronger, or just health concerns, really, I don't think environment was even something that was really being brought up that much at the time. Uh, this picture is from 1978, and in the center here is the Asarco Bag House. Uh, it was brand new in 79, and it had been installed as part of Asarco's, quote, modernization, end quote, to serve and curb industrial air pollution. And the bag house vented. Uh, essentially the, the refining plant to the left and hypothetically collected all of these materials so that they were no longer being injected into the environment, right? Uh, in reality, it's pretty well established that what this was actually doing is collecting calcine from the arsenic roasters, which could then be further processed uh, at a profit. And I, I don't think I'm being too jaded here when I say that you, if we were to line, line this whole thing out, you will always see a direct correlation between action and profit throughout the entire Sarko story. Um, and there have been requests, if you guys are interested, we could take this even deeper into, into the Sarko story. There are actually a tremendous amount of documents and areas around here where things have happened beyond just the main Asarco story. If you guys are interested in that, we I could have some guest people on to talk more about it. But for tonight, we're just focusing on the fact that the plant was here from the 1880s until 1986. And during that entire time, it was an operational facility creating heavy, toxic materials 
and dispersing them, mostly without regulation, into the area here. And while the bag house was a cute sort of gesture to be like, hey, we're taking care of stuff, you can see very real indicators of how much this area has been irrevocably changed by production at Asarco. And one of the biggest and boldest examples is this. So this picture is actually from uh, 1961. It's an aerial view, the Tacoma Yacht Club down there. Those are all the boats. Uh, that is Point Defiance Park right down there in the bottom left of this photograph. On the right, you can see the, the massive structure that is the Asarco facility. And in particular, if you can see in the bottom section there, right at the sort of bottom right corner of the harbor, there are those tanks. Uh, when the, the cleanup for Asarco was proposed, remediation had to be taken into account and those tanks were actually considered to have been cleaned and then placed uh, under traffic roundabouts. They were going to be capped by roundabouts, uh, <laughs> which we can get into a little bit later here. But this peninsula, right, is created through the process of refining copper. So as you're going through um, and creating fine copper, a tremendous amount of the byproduct is created, uh, including gold, silver, arsenic, uh, nickel sulfate, Sulfur dioxide is a huge one, as is, of course, arsenic and lead. And a big part of that comes from this. So these are cathode plates. Essentially, you take a plate of copper, you dip it in a bath of acid and electrify it and create a battery. And what that does is it attracts pure copper to the copper sheet. And then eventually you make a fine pure copper sheet, which you can then take out of the acid bath. And then that slag that's left over has to be dumped somewhere. Also, just through normal copper production before this process, this molten slag had to be dumped somewhere. And in 1914, there was a winter storm and Tacoma boat owners who wanted to break water in Commencement Bay uh, we're talking about it and in steps of Sarko and they're like, whoa, guys, you know, we're a friend of the people. Let's take care of you. And so Asarco proposes to make a breakwater for the Tacoma Yacht Club and boat owners in the area. And what they do is they create this peninsula by taking the molten slag of rare earth minerals, minerals, arsenic and lead and dumping it into the water, which is where we get the peninsula today. Um, oh, I want to make sure, oh, it looks like my photos aren't syncing up for you guys here. Let's, let's double check here. Can you guys see the, the peninsula right now? Cause this is, it should have a photo from Metro Parks Tacoma up there at the top here. This is of Point Defiance Yacht Basin. You can see the Tacoma smelter in the back there. And then this is that slag deposit right? Perfect. So I'm going to switch to the next one here. This is um, of that process. So you can see uh, into the not so distant past, the slag would still be molten while they're dumping it there. And originally they would take it out to the area by train. Eventually they moved to these uh, rails and tractors. And those massive pots full of molten material that hopefully we saw at the very beginning. Here, I'll switch to that one really quick. These ore slag pots would just be dumped into the water there. And they created this breakwater for the Tacoma Yacht Club, but they also created a massive ecological wasteland where not only do you now have these brittle um, materials that will release arsenic and lead into Puget Sound, uh, but it's, it's created just a dangerous spot to be. But uh, always the entrepreneurs, Tacoma turns to recreation in the very beginning. So if you're looking at this photo, you can see on the far end of the peninsula there, uh, what was once in 1933 called Funland. <laughs> Funland was an amusement park 
built in the 1930s uh, on that slag. And it was at Point Defiance, operated by Point Defiance Amusement Co. and was one of the most crowded areas in Point Defiance. And these are pictures from it in the 1930s. And it was, uh, it was a huge draw to the area. Some other stories of that slag pile that don't get as much recognition though, are like this one. Uh, so in 1938, while a train was taking slag out to the pile and dumping it in the water, an overhang of that material broke off and the six car locomotive, each carrying a vat of molten slag, dumped itself into the bay. And unfortunately, uh, a gentleman on that train was lost. So this is a diver in 1938, a guy named George Wayne. And he spent eight hours underwater trying to look for a Sarko employee, Fred Berkby. Uh, and unfortunately, he did find him. He had been drowned in that incident after he got pinned in between two cars from the slide train. And you don't hear a ton about that area or even how it was formed. But when you look at it out here, it's all part of the Asarco industry. This entire area, not just peninsula, was either terraformed to create rail and smelting industry, or it was actually built by dumping lead and arsenic molten slag into the water, creating more area. Which is how we end up with Point Defiance, um, Metro Park's newest area, Dune Peninsula. And for me, yes, I'm on board with this. I'm a huge proponent of how this was done. Because over the years, as the narrative starts to change on a Sarko, and it was a slow, slow twist, you had to figure out what comes next. And this is a good example of it. So as time goes on, in the 1960s, if you go through the reports, Asarco starts to see that this isn't going to become a feasible industry for them for too much longer. They were able to predict the fact that copper was going to start running out and the Asarco industry wasn't going to be able to maintain itself down here on the waterfront in Tacoma. Luckily for them, it was around the same time that environmental concerns started cropping up. So in the 1970s, uh, there starts to become a push by the newly authorized Environmental Protection Agency to start doing something about this area and testing starts happening. And they're discovering that there's a tremendous amount of lead and arsenic from the stack specifically in the area and that the site of the Asarco facility itself has just unspeakable amounts of pollution that have been added into the area. And so as these stories start coming out, it's, it's volatile because again, um, there's this pitch, right? And I, my heart goes out to the people of Tacoma and Ruston because they were caught in a vice here, right? the the lifeblood that's giving them immediate you know benefits that's providing medical support and money and infrastructure to them and their families that's always taking care of them is now pitching itself as being like well now that the epa is here i don't know if we're gonna be able to take care of you guys anymore uh, we want to do the right thing and clean up our site like we've always done for you but what can we do when it's never good enough for these guys? And so Rustin in particular, a lot of Tacoma get up in arms because they feel that the EPA is strong arming a Sarko into leaving the area. When we already have documented proof at this point that a Sarko, A, knew, knew what they were doing to the environment and the health of their employees, but also knew that they weren't going to be able to stick around no matter what. But they generate a lot of goodwill in the community by really stressing the fact that they just want to take care of people like they've always done. And the EPA won't let them do it. 
And so it was fascinating to me when I was going through this, the, the articles from the time are deeply sympathetic towards Astarco, even though there was now a huge swelling uh, starting to gain momentum of people recognizing that something irreparable had been done to the area and that it was going to have effects on them and their livelihoods and their futures. But at the time, there's mostly just fear that Ruston is going to get annexed by Tacoma. How are they going to pay for their utilities if they don't have this tax money coming in from Asarco? Where are their jobs going to come from? And man, some of the most fascinating articles for me come from the fact that when they're looking at what's going to happen to this area already, back then, uh, people had been talking about doing some sort of condo superstructure and Rustin was immediately against it as a majority there were holdouts of course but also that uh it was seen as something completely infeasible people thought there was no way that people would ever come in droves to Tacoma certainly not to buy high-end real estate and that there would be no commercial shopping that they would turn into a desolate ghost town overnight as soon as the Sarko left and when the decision eventually comes down the chain that Asarco is going to close, uh, and when they do in 1986, a lot of looking towards the future was focused on industrial development of that area. They're like, well, if Asarco goes, we could still use this plot for some sort of industry. It's already zoned for it. And Asarco warned, they're like, hey, if we get pushed out and you guys lose your industrial zoning, it's going to be bad for everyone. Bad forever. Meanwhile, uh, there's an amount of a small group of people that are starting to raise an even louder alarm about the fact that the ecological and pollution and destruction, the like fallout from everything, is way worse than people are acknowledging. So if you go now, and I, I've shared links to all this up on our Facebook page, I can share them again. You can look at the, the EPA studies that have been done in the area and you can go to dirt alert is what it's called and this is the tacoma smelter plume map and i've put up the legend for you here so that you can see um patterns of arsenic contamination from air emissions from the former asarco smelter in ruston and essentially by creating this 571 foot stack to safely disperse the arsenic and lead into the air so that it wouldn't hurt anyone they created a superstructure to blast it into the atmosphere and create a 1,000 square mile area of contamination. And the it's fascinating, really, because if you look over time, the EPA is less stringent on uh, parts per million of lead and arsenic contamination than the state of Washington actually is. Uh, so for the EPA, they're like, under this level, amount of lead is fine. Uh, same with arsenic. State of Washington's more stringent. They're like, no, you shouldn't be having any lead contamination in there. Uh, and there are more and more studies being done that show the detrimental effects of arsenic. There's the known effects of arsenic where you will get poisoning from the contamination of it. But uh, it actually makes you incredibly more susceptible to almost every form of cancer. And so while you won't die after prolonged arsenic exposure from arsenic poisoning itself, you can now develop a variety of cancers. With lead, it's particularly worrisome in children, uh, creating developmental, developmental disabilities after just relatively minor contamination over a period of time, and it's in the soil. So people's ground soil, look at the map. <laughs> uh, their topsoil is infected, is infused with arsenic and lead from that smelting operation. And so now they have to figure out what the hell are we gonna do? And so it starts with the, the proposed EPA cleanup. So records go back to the 1980s on thousands of yards in the area after the closing of Asarco in 1986, where what they do is they come in, they dig up 
all of that contaminated topsoil. They take it to a disposal facility, in our case, a landfill in Graham, in case you're curious. And then they put a protective layer over the top of it. Uh, in our case, it's a woven geotextile, which is essentially uh, several different strands of polyfibers, like high grade plastics, and they cap it. So they go down, remove the ground soil that's contaminated, cap the next layer so that groundwater or like rainwater doesn't get in and then infuse those toxins into the groundwater. And then they put new dirt on top. They put usually about a foot of non-contaminated topsoil, sod on top of that, hey presto, they're out. And all of this is the, the proposed path of what's going to happen. But the turning point is a volatile one. And people weren't thinking about the, the fallout, the literal fallout in some cases. Even though Asarco closes in 1986, the stack stays up until the 90s. And it's not until January of 1993 that the Asarco stack is slated to come down. And we can really get into the, the fine details of what was going on with this whole thing. But essentially what you need to understand is that Asarco was on the hook for ecological cleanup of the area. And then uh, they aren't really doing it because they're saying that, oh, the EPA wants us to do it to this way crazier standard. We just want to get it clean for you guys. And the EPA is like, no, you actually have to clean it. And they're like, oh, okay. And then they file for bankruptcy. So a Sarko is out. Uh, there's a huge lawsuit that comes out. Uh, they end up from that uh, bankruptcy suit, end up having to pay back a tremendous amount of that settlement to this area specifically for remediation of it. But before that all happens in 1993, the stack comes down. And I think that's perhaps the most iconic moment of the Asarco area for people here because tens I think uh, over 10,000 people showed up for this event. And we have a clip of it when it came down, when it was imploded. Oh God, that's the right. <coughs> so they had a series of charges in this and detonated it. And look at the crowd. That stack is full of lead and arsenic. And after it imploded, you see that cloud start to walk on the area. And there are multiple accounts of people who, who were there. They went to see it that day, right? And then as it blew up and everyone was cheering, they're having the best time ever, and that cloud wafted over them. They're like, oh, what have we done? So, yeah. Um, Yes, there, there have been issues with uh, things growing in the soil, with contamination on people there. I'm happy to share uh, the links from both the Washington State's Department of Ecology, uh, as well as the EPA, and studies have been done in the area. But yeah, there were problems not just with plants, but with animals in the area, and then with people. And it's a topic that gets glazed over a lot. There's not specifically something where it has to be disclosed if you sell a piece of real estate in the area. Uh, and there are places uh, where you can go, I'll, I'll share the links to these as well, and you can request uh, the State Department or the Washington State Department the test for this to come out. They'll test your ground soil. Essentially, they, they take it, they put it in a jar, shake it all up, and then they put it under a torch, and then a computer analyzes the flame. And based on the color of the flame, they can tell not only what uh, toxins or heavy metals are inside of that sample, but also at what degree they are. And if you qualify, if you have a high enough concentration in there, you can request that they come out and remediate the property. They'll scoop out all the topsoil, they'll cap it, they'll put new soil on there and grass. F fair warning and disclosure, it does take, based on the people I've talked to on this project, about a year uh, for it to happen because a thousand square miles. It's a massive cleanup operation that's gone on with this entire thing. 
there are some high points to this, though. Um, one, the Asarco facility is gone. Two, uh, this clip of Mr. Alan Brown, which I think has to be shared, uh, from the day that the stack went down, he is playing the long game here. He pretends that he is going to break a wine glass with the power of his voice, but incidentally destroys the Asarco stack and uh, that the whole thing was a cover-up for what he did that day. It's worth watching. It's Frederico Armageddon. Shall. It's it's a long it's a long joke. He was waiting for the long game. Uh, <laughs> I I think it's a, a noteworthy addition to the historic context of this whole thing. But again, what I think is actually really interesting about that is that you see that plume go out there, and Asarco knew uh, they used to have their employees scale up the stack and reclaim materials. Uh, Because they would actually, after jettisoning it out the stack, get a high concentration of reusable arsenic and lead that they would then process and resell. So they knew what was going on the whole time. Uh, Like I said, there are even shadier things that we could talk about, but I think we'll have to save it for another presentation on Asarco if you guys are interested. So... 1986, the plant shuts down. They're still out there, right? The last building of a Sarco isn't destroyed until 2005. And meanwhile, the EPA is working to create uh, a safe cap and remediation for all the area out there. And if you go out today and look at the area, you'll see something truly wondrous. The entire Asarco site has been changed to exactly what people said would never fly there. High-end condominiums and boutique shops. And this is a double, it's a double victory, I think, in a way. One, because it has taken an ecological wasteland, a completely desolate site of pollution and destruction, and turned it into something usable. And they did it the way that the the lawns and the yards of the area are being remediated as well. You have to create a safe cap, right? So first thing they do is that they remove all of that topsoil out there in the Ruston area. And then they create these caps to prevent groundwater from getting into it and from anything from coming back out. And it's the foundation of these buildings. The parking lots out there and the parking garages and the massive condos are designed specifically to act as impregnable concrete caps on the remediated site after additional soil was placed back on there. So the solution is twofold. Not only have they created something new and thriving, but they remediated the site the way that the EPA originally desired. And what's interesting about that is that the EPA was originally responsible for going out and handling remediation of the sites, but eventually that turns over to the state of Washington. And that's one of the things that makes it difficult today to figure out if your lawn has been uh, already tested or not, is that it switched from a federal record to a state record. And even now the state is still using funds from, excuse me, (coughs) <coughs> that original super fund and uh, a Sarko bankruptcy pile dedicated to making sure that these lawns get changed over. But people have been fighting it. Um, there are still people that are ardent supporters of the Asarco facility and think that there aren't any negative effects to lead or uh, arsenic contamination, even when you can show them the tested results for their particular lawn. 
For me, I think one of the most beautiful examples of how this area <coughs> excuse me, has changed uh, comes from a story of local author Frank Herbert. And Frank Herbert, the author of Dune, is a Tacoma native who grew up in the area. He would swim in the waters of Puget Sound. Uh, he used to paddle his boat. I kid you not, from Tacoma up to the San Juans. He he played in this area, came of age here, and eventually goes on to become a reporter and then the author of Dune. And to tell that story beautifully, uh, Metro Parks Tacoma is letting me play the video that they put together on it because that slag peninsula, right, that, that massive land created just out of lead, arsenic, refuse from copper production has been turned into dune peninsula park and they did the exact same thing where they took something that shouldn't have supported life at all and in the remediation process created something vibrant and beautiful and iconic to the area so here they are i love this it's not often that fiction comes to life the original dune a groundbreaking science fiction book by Tacoma author Frank Herbert imagined a world that had seen incredible ecological destruction. And now, the 2021 movie Dune centers on reclaiming that world from the sand. But what's really cool is that in the city where Frank Herbert grew up, the city that inspired Dune's planetary damage, is a real-life ending to that story. A real-life Dune. We're talking about Dune Peninsula at Point Defiance Park. Let me tell you a little bit about Frank Herbert. Frank was born in 1920, and he had the kind of childhood that seems impossible today. At age nine, he rode from Tacoma to the San Juan Islands, all on his own. At 14, he swam across the Tacoma Narrows, again, alone. But this Lincoln High School graduate wasn't just outdoorsy. He loved books and writing. He wrote for the Tacoma Ledger and the Tacoma Times, and for a while he was a speechwriter for an Oregon senator. It was there that he discovered the dunes along the Oregon coast, and the idea of a world covered with giant sand dunes was born. But it was here in Tacoma that the environmental message of dune was born, because Frank had a deep respect for nature, especially for Puget Sound and the polluting of the sound during the 1950s dismayed him. A copper smelter next to Point Defiance spewed out a daily stream of arsenic and cadmium into the air and water. As Frank said, the Asarco smelter created air so thick you could chew it. That pollution created Frank's resolve that something had to be done to save the earth. That resolve became doomed. When Dune was published in 1965, it became a science fiction landmark. The environmental theme was a big part of that. Dune is a message, not just an excuse to write about ray guns. It's something to be taken seriously, especially today, as we face the planetary threat of climate change. But now, planet Earth has its own Dune, right here in Tacoma. Dune Peninsula Park opened in 2019 after years of community collaboration. Spearheaded by Metro Parks Tacoma, the toxic smelter site was cleaned up, capped to contain dangerous chemicals, and sculpted into a stunning landscape of flowing dunes and rocky shores. Now, birds stop to feed. Harbor seals rest. People gather with friends, hear concerts, and have picnics. It's a place of peace, of belonging, for people and wildlife. What's so cool about Dune Peninsula is that our collective actions to create this park mirror the book and the movie. There, characters called the Fremen plan to restore their planet after colonial exploitation and ecological collapse. And that's very much like what we did with this park. We've taken a wasteland created by the very smelter that inspired Dune, and we've turned it into a beautiful place of nature. 
That cyclical theme is what's so hopeful. We can use this park to remember our past environmental mistakes while celebrating how we can change them for the future. It will take time and working together, but we can do it. Wherever we come from, we can make a new beginning. We can protect our place and restore balance. There's no better place on earth to remember that Dune promise than right here in Tacoma. I absolutely love that. Because it's true. Like, what, what do you do? First of all, the Frank Herbert connection to Tacoma is amazing. Metro Parks Tacoma did a bang rang job with that video. But, like, what do you do? You know, irreparable damage has been done to the area, and you can't unring that bell. So, by doing the best you can and remediating that, space and then turning it back into something hopeful and useful chef's kiss um you know i was in the area i used to drive past when it was still the asarco wasteland when that last building was still out there and to now go out and see the like point rustin universe right like the four person bicycles cruising past and like its whole complex of entertainment and the farmer's market out there, it is in just such a short period of time, really something astounding. And I think something to strive for because the, the Asarco area for over a hundred years decimated this space and, and turned it into something that could have by all means been completely unusable for time immemorial. And if they had not been chased out of the area, I think they would still be in operation doing their thing today. Because even though uh, the copper production side of it went downhill, they recognized that they could still turn a profit on sulfur dioxide or other things that they were producing in that facility. Uh, and it wasn't until the EPA really pushed it that it went out. Um, like I said, there are some other fascinating things that have come to me down the line uh, from a salvage diver in the area, Mr. Bob Mester, whom you guys probably know from previous presentations. If you are interested in hearing what he has discovered in the area and specifically the waters of Commencement Bay uh, about the activities of Asarco over the years, please let me know. I'd be happy to have him on as a guest. And I know he'd be delighted to talk to you guys about all that has happened out here. Whew, so happy Earth Month, guys. Um, like I said, it's it's a I try to be balanced about it, right? Like a Sarko gave a lot of immediate benefits to this community and changed a lot of people's lives for the better and the jobs that it created and was a brilliant icon for the area, creating so much of the usable materials right here in Tacoma notwithstanding the fact that they were also, I think we have documents showing that they sold a great deal of the, the bullets that actually went to the Japanese and the Germans uh, before our engagement in World War II. But they knew, they knew what they were doing to their workers and to the area all the way from the 1880s into the 1980s and the contamination that's been done to the area. There was never really any intention of cleaning it up to any reasonable degree, leaving us where we are today. So if you guys want to find uh, the levels of arsenic or lead in your yard, you can use the links I'll share with you guys shortly. Uh, you can get that tested for free. And then if you qualify, if you're in the area, you can get your yard remediated. And like I said, it's a slow process, but so is the process of dying of lead poisoning. So something to consider as we all look forward to a brighter future and hopefully just start taking care of the place instead of profit margins a little bit more. I'm not saying you can't have both, but some things last forever. So we got to take care of them. Whew. With that, thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. As always, if you feel the need to tip your guide, you can always do so on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com, or I can give you guys a little QR code here that you can just scan with your phone. Uh, never necessary, but always appreciated. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys soon. We have some great 
virtual programming coming up down the way. And please, please, please go down and check out the FOSS Waterway Seaport every third Thursday of the month is free admission. So you can go, you can wander around to your heart's delight and let Columbia Bank pick up the tab for you. So if you guys have questions, let me know. If not, thank you so much. Okay, good. I got I got some good stuff here. We'll definitely uh, do a follow-up one then. I will, I'll get in contact with Mester and we'll get him on board for that. Also, I saw just a, a question here. Where, where does the um, contaminated soil go? Yes, uh, it is sent to, last I know, there is a uh, landfill out by Graham where it's capped and then kept. Uh, so they're not decontaminating it. I think we are beyond or we don't have the technology for that yet, certainly to do it affordably. Uh, so at this point, it's just being capped. And then hopefully someday we can discover a way to do that. But for now, out by Graham is your answer. So thank you guys. I will talk to you soon. Keep on exploring.